Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. My name is Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. It's good to see a nice student audience, albeit in the last half of the room. Uh, we're glad you're all here. The McFarland Center sponsors and supports lectures, discussions, conferences, and a variety of events on campus that foster dialogue on questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. You can find a schedule of our events, videos online, including in a couple days a video of this that you can show your friends who should be sorry that they missed it, uh, at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Today, I'm really delighted to welcome Christy Navin Warren uh, to Holy Cross for a talk on Heartland Catholicism, how faith and migration in rural America are shaping parishes, reshaping parishes and communities. The lecture is one of the Deitchman family lectures in religion and modernity. We're grateful to John Deitchman, the class of 1970, who makes this possible, his family and their generous support. Professor Navin Warren is Associate Vice President of Research and Professor of Religious Studies and Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies, and holder of the VO and Elizabeth Call Figge Chair in Catholic Studies at the University of Iowa. Holy Cross students know the name Figge well. Uh, I imagine uh, and, and the Figge family has deep ties to Holy Cross. I once saw an article that counted 10 Figge family members here. No, there may be more, but there were 10 at least in that article. Uh, but some of you here in the audience know it more because uh, you may actually live in Figgy Hall, uh, uh, or aspire to do so, if maybe if you're living just here in one of the little hill dorms. Uh, the late John Call Figgy of the class of 1959 was a Holy Cross trustee and a great benefactor of the college, and uh, V.O. Uh, Figgy was his father. Elizabeth Figgy was his mother. Uh, and Figgy Hall is part of that family legacy that also includes uh, the endowing Professor Navin Moore's academic chair. I'm also delighted that Mary Figge Power, the class of 83, and Michael Figge, the class of 93, have been great uh, friends and benefactors of the college are here with us today. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Professor Navin Moore and become acquainted with her work. I was fascinated by her ethnographic field work on the cultural and religious diversity in Iowa's meatpacking plants. Her book, published in 2021, is Meatpacking America, How Migration, Work, and Faith Unite and Divide the Heartland. Focusing her research on Latinx Catholics in the United States, she's author of four other books, The Virgin of El Barrio, Marian Apparitions, Catholic Evangelizing, and Mexican-American Activism, Cursillos in America, Catholics, Protestants, and Fourth-Day Spirituality, American Woman, The Virgen de Guadalupe, Latinos, Latinas, and Accompaniment, and last year, the Handbook of Latino Latina Christianities. Professor Nava Warren has published numerous articles, book chapters, and book reviews, and is a regular reviewer and blurb writer for new books. So very generous on some of those things. She's a creator and acquisition editor for Where Religion Lives, a series of books that provides ethnographies of religion around the world, of particular interest to me. Passionate about mentoring young scholars, as you can tell already while we're getting things set up. She's currently working on a new book called Storytelling, the Art of Ethnographic Research and Writing, a hybrid autoethnography and methods book for classroom use that focuses on 30 years of ethnographic as an ethnographer of religion. I'm sure you'll be fascinated to hear more from her as well. And please join me in welcome Professor Christine Navin Horn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I want to thank Dr. Thomas Landry and Ruby Francis for all the great work behind the scenes bringing me out um, and to the McFarland Center and to the Figgies. I've been wanting to meet members of the Figgy family because it's a reason why I moved to the University of Iowa because I got this wonderful endowed chair position and um, it's why I this book came out because I got really interested in religion, specifically Catholicism in Iowa. So thank you so much. Um, so thank you all for coming, and like I said, at the end, I really want to get questions from you and how I can make my work more student-focused, because that's really important to me. As a mother of three teenagers, um, I, want to get, I want to get students involved, right? All right, my little presentation to you today, I've timed myself at about 32 minutes. I might go over a little bit, because I always want to have time for questions and, and actual dialogue, right? And so today's presentation is really based on seven years or so of research, deep ethnography that went into my most recent book, Meatpacking um, America. Um, okay, but before
before I start, I want you to indulge me in a little exercise here. So I want you all to close your eyes. Take a deep breath in, and then take a deep breath out. Keep your eyes closed. I'm doing this as well, I promise you. My prompt for you is, what are you curious about? What are you really interested in right now? What, what do you find yourself thinking a lot about? What might even keep you up at night? I'll give you a second. You can open your eyes whenever you're ready. So me, for me, not only as a scholar, but as a human, um, it's been really important um, to have curiosity as my guide in all of my academic work and just being a, a good citizen, right? And I think if I think about what led to my current academic interests and all the books and articles and things that have come out, it's curiosity that's really driven me. Specifically, I was born in Northwest Indiana, Gary, Indiana, actually, and I was a great-granddaughter of migrants. Migrants from the Beha Valley in Lebanon on my dad's side, so I grew up hearing a lot of Arabic, um, Polish on my mom's side. Both sides were deeply Catholic, or a very tiny Lutheran part of my family. I actually was raised Lutheran, but in a very much a mixed faith household. And so my own cultural, linguistic, ethnic milieu, to, to kind of throw in a little academic term there, very much led me to ask questions about why do people migrate and make new homes? What role does faith play in people's lives? And how does one's work define their sense of self and belonging? And lastly, and relatedly, can the American dream become a reality? Because what I was hearing in both, sets, both sides of the family was how work was important, work was a way to lift my family members out of the poverty that they were fleeing from, from their countries. Faith was really important to keep them grounded, to give them hope. Um, Specifically in the steel mills, they had a lot of members, men in my family worked at the mills and women. And they used the, the language of American dream. Not always specifically, but they, they talked about America as the speaking of hope. And I think that from when I was a very little girl, um, those are the things that really led to Christy the scholar and Christy the mother later on as well. So we'll go back to curiosity later. The method of research that I really embraced from a young age, actually, so I wrote my undergraduate honors thesis, I wanted to have an opportunity to, to get to know my grandfather and his sisters more because they, they were getting older, right? And they were all from Lebanon. And so I remember my honors thesis was Lebanese Christian Women Then and Today. It was like this really ambitious title when really it was about eight women and their stories. <laughs> you know, well, not eight women, five women and their stories and then my grandfather and then a couple other family members, too. And so for me, ethnography, which is the method of participation, observation, and listening, right? Um, it's really a way of cultivating relationships. And I think that is a method that really, really spoke to me, right? So I know you're all students here. When you're thinking about what you want to do with your life, I would really suggest do something that you're interested in, that, you, that excites you. And for me, I love sitting down drinking coffee or Coke, I guess it was that time I was drinking Coca-Cola. Later on, the, a lot of beers when I was, you know, doing research in Latino communities, uh, lots of cups of coffee at, at kitchen tables. Um, and I love sitting at kitchen tables, hearing people's stories and making sense of those stories and sharing them with the rest of the world. And I think at the heart of ethnography is a form of crafting relationships. So ethnography for me has been a lot of immersion, listening, observing, and also it's been really important to have humility, humilidad, the researcher as a student. And I think that's hard for a lot of academics to do actually, right? You know, but I think for me at least, in my line of work, if, if people are gonna trust me with their life stories, their hurts, their pains, their dreams, their ambition, I had to really humble myself to just listen and to just let them talk and it really shift my orientation um, as like it, this is a real privilege to hear somebody's story back in um, the summer of 2017 i did a borderlands listening tour with my cousin 
Gary Paul Nabhan, who is my other family academic, um, one of the only other Nabhans who actually left the region, Northwest Indiana. So for years he taught at University of Arizona, and he recently retired. He's an ethnobotanist. So if you want some really good books on ethnobotany, uh, Gary Paul Nabhan is he's a very good scholar. So we did this sort of goodwill listening tour because there was a lot of, you know, build the wall rhetoric at the time. There was a lot of anti-immigration rhetoric going on. And we really, uh, he's also an ethnography, really, really wanted to kind of be boots on the ground, going down there. He rented us a van from University of Iowa, and, or University of Arizona, sorry. I flew down there and we spent a whole week talking to folks on the borderlands. And these were two moms, madres, and their children. And they were both actually expecting, they were both, they look very happy here, which I love this picture because the stories that they shared with my cousin and I were stories of hope. They were both fleeing domestic violence from their villages. They wanted to come to Los Estados Unidos so that their children would have a better life. And one thing that I always want to get across to audiences, whether I'm speaking to donors for the university, or students, or nonprofits, or church groups, is that none of the migrants I've, I've worked with, refugees, asylees, economic, migrants, there's all kinds of categorization that we created uh, as, as a United States. Every single human I talked to shared with me they did not want to leave because they had to, because they wanted to, but because they had to. They were fleeing some form of political, religious, physical violence, and they wanted to come to Los Estados Unidos for a better life for their children. So the American dream was definitely an underlying, even overarching, really, narrative. So I go back to this week-long ethnographic experience because it really helped. At that time, I was also collecting stories in Iowa from men and women who had crossed many different borders to make it to the state of Iowa. Iowa is not the first destination state. It's usually the secondary or the tertiary. And most men and women come to Iowa for work, and I'm going to get to that in a bit. So it was important for me as an ethnographer to literally go to the border and to talk to folks right before they crossed over, like, what are you thinking? Why, why Los Estados Unidos? What do you hope will happen here? And I think that became a really important, while it doesn't figure into the book, um, it remained really prominent in my mind as a pivotal moment in my research. So my curiosity is what drove me to the borderlands and helped me make sense of the stories I was hearing in a new borderlands in the Midwest. So why research rural Iowa? How many of y'all are from the Midwest? Where are you from? I'm from Iowa City. Are you kidding me? Where did you go to high school? City High. <gasps> City High is great. My kids go to West, but I don't fall in love with West is best because I think they're great high school. I, I'm just even glad that you're here. Oh my God. I'm a city rapping right here. Yeah. Did you ever have Beth that wife says an English teacher? I, she's my favorite. Wait, we have to talk after. I'm done. No, I'm not done. We're sorry. She's one of my best friends. Yes. Really? Yeah. Neighbors. My life. We're a feminist book club together. Lots of things. Lots of things to talk about. I was saying, if y'all from the Midwest and the rest of y'all, yay, where are you from with that? Minneapolis. Minneapolis, yay, okay. Got Minneapolis? Hi. Yes. Ben Dorf. Ben Dorf. Ben Dorf. You've got that cool paw print little going on. I love that the logo, right? Didn't go there, but also, da also Davenport. No, we went to Assumption High School. You went to Assumption, great school, great Catholic school, very good Catholic school. This, <laughs> this is fun. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Can yeah. I take We need it for the recording. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's going to oh. Sorry, I move, I move a lot. <laughs> Probably I'm undiagnosed a little. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, any other Midwesterners? We've got, we've got Iowa, we've got Minneapolis. Any other Midwesterners? All right. Well, think in the back of your minds what you think you know about the Midwest, okay? Because I'm here to challenge y'all a little bit. So as a lifelong Midwesterner, say, a couple, say for a couple years in Arizona where I did my master's work, and two years in Kentucky, it was my first teaching job out of grad school, which was wonderful, I think there's a lot of tropes, stereotypes about the Midwest, right? What are some of those stereotypes? What are some of those stereotypes? Tell me. What are some of the stereotypes that you hear? What is the Midwest? Not sophisticated. Not sophisticated. Flyover. Flyover. Mm -hmm. Cornfields. Cornfields. 
Beans. 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 Soy beans. Yes. And some of this Hops. is yeah. true. Hops. Yeah. yeah. We've got a lot of animals. White. Yes. White. I'm going to challenge a little bit. Yes. Yes. What else? Nice. Nice. I'm going to complicate that a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of alcohol. Yes. Yeah. We're pretty good to party. Yeah. Lots Naive. Naive. Okay. A lot of, lot of tropes, stereotypes. And as we know, there's, there's a partial truth in, in a lot of stereotypes, right? So we're going to unpack that today. I think, full disclosure, I've probably always had a little bit of chip on my shoulder as someone from Indiana. Everyone's like, oh, you're a Hoosier. What does that mean? Okay, I don't know. No one really knows what a Hoosier means, but I guess it's kind of cool. I'm a big IU fan. But I think it's long bothered me when people make hot takes, if you will. Like, they might know a little bit about a place, or they might visit it once, and they think they know everything about it. And so I see the role of a scholar, not just myself, but I think an important role of scholarship is we take colder takes. Our research is based on years of deep research, in my case, deep immersion for seven years in rural communities talking to folks. And what I hope to put out there will complicate many of the tropes that we have. Yes, I was very white. Yes, we have a lot of animals and corn and soybeans. We have a huge butter sculpture every year at the State Fair. We have a lot of corn, which is really good. We even have deep fried Twinkies, which are delicious, I can tell you. But it's more complicated. Without sounding trite, a subtitle today's talk could be it's complicated. Columbus Junction, Iowa. So how did I choose Columbus Junction, Iowa as one of my primary field sites? One of the things that in, in particular I was wondering about Iowa in terms of Catholicism was I knew that rural areas are declining in population, white population that is. I also know that rural areas are sites of meatpacking plants and industries that are drawing non-white populations. So throughout rural Iowa and the rural Midwest, right, the landscape literally is changing in terms of human populations. And so Columbus Junction, Iowa was a great place to have a field site because the priest I became very good friends with, Father Joseph Sia, was very welcoming. Um, he loved, yeah, you know, Father Joseph is now at St. Pat's in, in Iowa City, good friend. Um, he was very welcoming. He said, yes, you can, you, know, you can interview my parishioners. So over a couple years, I interviewed parishioners at um, St. Joseph the Worker and then eventually made my way to the Tyson uh, meat plant packing plant and did a bunch of interviews there and had a tour, several tours. So what's interesting about towns like Columbus Junction is that they're really on the forefront of change. Um, not only, so if we study small towns like Columbus Junction and do research in, in small parishes like St. Joseph, we can really understand broader changes in our country, right? Here's Father Joseph Sia, priest and advocate. Every year he gives a farm workers mass for um, men from central Mexico who are bussed in by Bell's Melons to harvest melons and other crops. Um, he leads an outdoor mass. One of the families, a uh, long time, the Fernandez family, they have a huge meal and they have an outdoor mass for farm workers. So like 250 men, Mexican men, come every summer um, to get a good meal and to meet Father Joseph, um, and his family puts on a whole meal, which is really lovely. So one of the things that I realized after conducting interviews for a couple years at St. Joseph and other parishes, so West Liberty also a St. Joseph, there's a lot of St. Josephs and a lot of St. Mary's in Iowa. So I was focusing mostly on West Liberty, Iowa, Columbus Junction, and Washington, Iowa. So those are three of my primary sites. And as I coded my interviews, uh, you know, you go through interviews, you code them, and then you ask yourself, what am I finding? What I found, and I was also interviewing some non-Catholic workers, right, Jehovah's Witnesses, Protestants, and Muslim workers who worked at the Iowa Premium Beef in Tama, so I'll get to them in a bit. So when I was coding all the interviews, what I discovered was that all of these men and women talked about how they wanted to work hard for the families, how they prayed to Allah, God, the Virgin Mary, Jehovah, Jesus Christ to keep them safe. And they would use material items, like a lot of the men had tattoos of the Virgin of Guadalupe on their bodies. They had amulets and rituals, scapulars, rosaries that they would touch and pray to to shield them from harm before they would drive to their dangerous shift at the meatpacking plant, um, praying to God, the Virgin Mary Allah, to get them through. Because meatpacking plant work is very, very dangerous. And I'm going to get to that now. Okay. I'm going to share with you my friends Maurice and Benita. 
Um, Maurice still works at uh, the Tyson plant in Columbus Junction, where he is no longer a head dropper. That is literally a job title. He's a translator. But I'm going to read to you um, from an interview I had from several years ago. For five days a week, sometimes six, Maurice would don his work uniform, which included safety gloves, and would slice the head. Sorry, little trigger alert. This might be a little gruesome for you. I, I apologize. Apologize, but also it's important to get you into this world to read this to you. He would slice the head off a hog until it was hanging by an approximately five inch flap of skin. It was important to not cut the head off all the way as a USDA inspector who stood beside him would inspect the hog's head for disease and make sure it passed inspection. The work was difficult, cold, and hand numbing. His fingers would grow stiff and swollen after the day's work, and standing all day made him fatigued. And during our interview, his wife, Danita, shook her head as she recalled how Maurice looked after, looked after a shift as a head dropper. She held up her right hand and rubbed her fingers gently as she described her husband's hands after a work shift. Quote, his fingers were so swollen, you know, like, like sausages. I would massage them and clean them for him each night. She worried that her husband was working too much and too hard, but Maurice did not want his wife to do that kind of hard, intensive labor that he did at Tyson. He supported her goal to become a nurse. I'm happy to say she's now a practicing nurse. And she took classes at a local community college, Kirkwood Community College, at night. He loved her smooth, beautiful hands with their long, tapered fingers and wanted them to stay that way. Maurice and Benita were happy to raise their sons in this small Iowa city that they felt was much safer than Johannesburg, where they came over on a diversity lottery with their family. Iowa has good schools, a wonderful church about a mile from their apartment. Iowa City, where they now live, is also affordable and just a 40-minute drive to Maurice's work at the Columbus Junction Tyson plant. The commute is made, was made much easier as Maurice joined a carpool five to six days a week with a lively group of African co-workers from the DRC. The only bad part of their new home, said Benito with a chuckle, is the cold. Her first winter in Iowa was, oh my gosh, terrible, just like I could not believe how cold it was, end quote. And it wasn't just the temperatures that made life difficult that first winter season. It was the cold wind that made Benita just cry some days. So I wanted to introduce you just briefly to a couple friends I made in the course of the research. Um, the book is full of stories, and it's always hard kind of shrinking in seven years of research into a half-hour talk, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so now I want to introduce you to, so Maurice works at the Tyson plant in Columbus Junction, which is known as a processing town. Processing towns um, have been revitalized by the new migrations, as well as polluted by the plants themselves, which are bringing, which are revitalizing the economy. So there's a lot, again, it's very complicated, right? Um, I spent a lot of time at the, high, as, at the Tyson Hawk facility interviewing workers, taking a couple tours, and now I want to read from you a little bit, just to literally take you inside the plant, if you don't mind. Okay. Close your eyes if you want. I'm going to talk about blood a little bit. Just a little, just a little trigger warning there. How many of y'all have ever been in a packing plant? Okay, okay. This is not okay. This was my first time. I didn't faint, but I thought I was going to, but I did. I'm impressed that you did. Walking out to a meatpacking plant floor for the first time is like stepping into an alternative reality. But this was real, bloody real. It was loud, cold, and crimson red. There was a lot going on, and it was loud. There is an intense order to the plan, and each worker has a repetitive, yet also highly skilled task. We walked by women and men with various knives and blades cutting through the now chilled pork meat, slicing and cutting parts that would be sold at wholesale and re retail markets. Their white coats were splattered with blood. The plant was cold and constantly surveilled by U USDA inspectors. Fat, meat droppings, and the occasional eyeball washed down drains next to our feet. We walked and stood amidst thousands of pounds of cold flesh. As I raised my eyes to look above me, a light spray of water mixed with hog waste managed to enter my mouth. I knew I should not spit it out and wanted to, so I swallowed it. I can still taste, smell, and see the meat as I read this to you. At this particular pork processing plant, 10,000 hogs at 200 pounds apiece are killed, or as the company prefers to say, harvested. There's a lot of euphemisms used here. And processed each day. 
Rows upon rows of sows with raised teats on their underbellies. They recently nursed and unbeknownst to them weaned their piglets. That was hard for me, I have to tell you, as a mother. Move past us, slow enough so that we could take in their girth and their lifeless bodies. As we followed Dave's path through the cold cutting floor, the hog's feet and hooves grazed my arms and shoulders and bumped gently into my white, smocked, coated side. They were heavy and rubbery, so heavy that I stumbled a bit as the first body brushed against me. Turning from the hogs on our right, I learned that prime rib meat that we see in the stores is cut by a highly trained worker whose primary job is to slice blades in a precise way. And this job is actually the highest paid at the plant. It's a black helmeted job. The helmets are color coded. And so the white helmets are paid the least and the black helmets are paid the most. Interesting fact. The Sudanese employee cutting the prime rib meats used graceful and precise movements, slicing through huge slabs of meat that move by him in a conveyor line. According to Dave, this was one of the hardest jobs on the line, one that required exact timing, a degree of swiftness, and graceful bodily movements. He also told us that African and Latino workers are the best because they have the, quote, best work ethic. We can unpack that later, too. The worker we witnessed in action was like a dancer, but one who dodges blades and knives with precision and elegance. It was very cold in the plant. We could see our breath. The damp air is kept at a constant temperature of 35 degrees Fahrenheit. If you've ever worked in a restaurant, raise your hand, and have been inside the cold storage room where they keep meats and cheeses, that's what it felt like. But think for eight, nine hours that you're in there. Kind of like a freezer, but not quite. Dave, the manager, informed us that meat rots from the inside out, and that if it's too warm in the area, the meat will spoil, hence the cold, the cold air. The team members all wore mesh gloves, but they were wet with blood and flesh, and they froze easily. From time to time, another team member came around to replace the gloves with dry ones every couple hours, and the cycle continued throughout the day. Wet and cold hands apparently are slow and prone to accidents. Dry hands work better and faster and are injured less frequently. There's two chapters in the book that really take, go through in detail what it's like in a plant, because it's really important to me as an anthropologist um, doing this kind of work, it's a very embodied experience, and so it's important for me, I think my big goal as a researcher and writer is to get empathy when people read my work and when I give, give talks, whatever we think about migration, wherever we are on the political spectrum, that my work can somehow amplify the voices of the people I've met and to inculcate empathy, right? Because these are hard jobs that, frankly, none of us in here, our families probably have ever had to do, right? Um, it's very raced on the floors of meatpacking plants. It's almost all brown and black workers, Latinos, Central Americans, um, Africans from the Congo, Sudan, Somalia. And so um, there's a racialized economy uh, on the plant floor. And I have some colleagues at Indiana University, some sociologists, who are doing some really good work on the new racialized economy. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of really good work out there right now. Um, Jill Belay uh, became a good friend of mine. He is the former chaplain in football, also known as soccer here in the United States, uh, coach at the Tyson Columbus Junction. Fun fact, how many of you know, knew, know, that at every single Tyson meatpacking plant there is a chaplain? Who knew? Didn't know that. Tyson has the largest, is the, one of the biggest companies in the world, and it has, uh, in every Tyson plant there's a chaplain. So part of my research, I was really interested in how the workers themselves talked about religion and faith, what they did in their home, what they did in the parishes, um, how the parishes were really important places for them. But because they spent most of their waking hours at work, it was important for me to understand what happened at work. How did religion, in other words, work for the workers at work? I was also interested in doing what some anthropologists would call, so anthropology from the top down, and then I was doing anthropology from the bottom up, so grassroots up, and then from the top down. The top down, it was getting a sense of what the CFOs, CEOs, the line ship managers, what were they saying about religion? Well, we actually were saying a lot. So Tyson is very, very open about its Christianity and sees its work as providing for workers and being good servant leaders. And so when you study religion like I have, you pick up on a lot of code terms like servant leader, faith, family members. Um, we're a business of faith. And so there was 
a thinly veiled, thinly coded religious lexicon taking, uh, taking place in the workplace that is very interesting. And there's a lot of scholars doing this work now. Rice University has a faith at work. Uh, there's a whole center run by Elaine Howard Eklund, who's doing really good sociological work. Um, so there's this faith at work going on. So I was sort of interested in both the top down and then what are the people themselves doing with religion. So here's the team that Joe led the second place win, and they've actually they won first place a couple of years after that. So I want to complicate the meatpacking plant industry a little bit more. So we have a lot of hog, we have a lot of CAFOs in our state, confined animal feeding operations. You've got these sows, you know, shoved into small confined areas. They're basically birthing facilities, right? Here's a problem too. This is not something I personally want to be known for in our state, but we're number one and number two in Iowa. We are number one in fecal matter, apparently, because we have so many sows, right? And we don't know what to do with all of the waste matter. So in the winters, even in Iowa City, we're not a rural area, you'll smell when the farmers are spraying the waste on the, on the frozen fields, right? And what happens is that it runs off into the waterways. So we've got a real big environmental problem in our state, right? So we've got the meatpacking plant industries, which are providing jobs, which are, are providing a good living for a lot, of, a lot of families in our state. But we have what's, what's becoming an environmental catastrophe. We've got fertilizer, hog waste running into the Gulf of Mexico and creating a dead zone. So what do we do about that, right? Scholars like myself, we ask questions, we're curious. We also, and I think it's important to not only point out problems, but also try to come up with solutions, right? So I can talk to you a little bit about that. So here's me in my hard hat. I was very low ranking for that week. Um, I spent a week at Iowa Premium Beef. I stayed at a motel up the road from IPB, and I would clock in at 5 a.m. I'd usually get back to the motel around 7 that night, and I went through the new orientation where I was like a new hire, and then I got to work on the line later in the week. So the beautiful thing about doing the field work at IPB and Tama for a week was that I really got a good sense of what went on in the packing plant, even more so than Tyson. And I also had really free reign. I got to talk to workers. I got to conduct a lot of interviews there. I had a pretty amazing access. I should tell you that all the research for the book was done before COVID. I think that would be really, really hard to get the access now. And so I'll share, I'll share some of that with you in a minute. Like Tyson at IPB, it's really corporate religion at work. I heard so much about Stuart leadership, we really care for our workers, their family, over and over and over again. And I'm gonna to get to COVID in a minute. The good, the bad, the ugly, but also the silver lining. One of the things that I like to point out, and I want students to think about too, is I think the best stories are the complicated stories. I think most stories are complicated, both and but. So what I found in the course of my research is that when we look at the meatpacking plant industry, it's a commodification of flesh and death. It's a vertical integration of non-human bodies and human bodies, right? So we have um, insemination barns, we have birthing barns, um, and we even have corn and soybeans before that. And all these industries are all connected and they lead to the slaughterhouses, right? And I make the argument in the book that just as the cattle's bodies and the sow's bodies are, um, are considered as sort of like, that's what they're meant to do, workers, right? Black, brown and black bodies, it's considered this is the work that these folks are meant to do, which is really problematic. And so I think it's important for scholars like myself and budding scholars like yourselves to really think about how can I problematize what I'm, what I'm hearing. The upside, I heard from many of these workers when I was conducting interviews in parishes in, in rural Iowa and at the packing plants themselves, that they're grateful for these jobs because these are really high paying jobs for rural America. They're making $20 an hour, which was more than what they could make at McDonald's. Um, they would get um, you know, reduced rates on the meat to bring home. And so I heard a lot of stories of gratitude, right? So again, it's both and, but also hearing stories and seeing how small towns who were starting to go under, you know, storefronts were closing, um, had been really revitalized by migrations to these areas and by the packing plants that are also polluting, right? So it's deeply complicated. So as a scholar, I want to, we want, we want to complicate, and we also want to look for solutions too. 
So as we know, COVID-19 hit our country really, really hard. And my book was in press then. They literally stopped the presses so that I could go back in and add a little epilogue. Because I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to say something about COVID-19. This is, you know. And so what, what we know now is that the lexicon, the language of faith, family, and values that these companies were using, right, was really put to the test in COVID-19. They did not really treat their workers like family. They did not really um, act like good servant leaders, right? They covered up sicknesses and even deaths at plants, right? And we know the complicity. There was a House report that came out in 2020. And I want to say that while all this is going on, going back to Father Joseph Sia, one of the things that has impressed me so much with religion, and I'm a religious studies scholar, religion in my state of Iowa, is that there are so many priests and religious leaders and nuns, gotta love the nuns, right? Doing amazing on the ground work of social justice, right? So my friend Father Joseph, my friend Father Bernie in Washington, my friend Father Greg in West Liberty are doing the work of social justice where they're ministering to refugees, going to their homes, trying to talk with the meatpacking plant workers, saying, hey, my parishioners are struggling and suffering. You've got to do something. So what I saw, so with silver lining, even before COVID-19, these priests and religious leaders were doing a lot of work, what theologians would call accompaniment, of accompanying the poor, in this case, migrants and working class people. But it really ramped up um, in the wake of COVID where we see, and we saw a lot of interfaith work, Catholics working with Protestants, working with imams throughout our state to really say, okay, we can talk about immigration reform, that's something that we need to talk about, but right now, what do we do to keep these families safe? What do we do to put pressure on the meatpacking plants to provide protective gear, to provide hand sanitizer, to provide all these things? So it was a really a beautiful thing to see um, interfaith dialogue go from dialogue to actually boots on the ground working to assist and accompany um, vulnerable workers. I always like to end on hope too because I am a deeply hopeful person. If it were summer, you would see my emerging sleeve, my emerging tattoos. But I have, one of the things that I had added was optimism is true moral courage. And I think going back to Navite, I think one of the things that people think about Midwesterners is that we're naive. And I've had some people say, oh, optimism is really naive. And I say, actually, I really think one's being morally courageous if one is, is, one, if one is optimistic. Because I think that, yes, we know there's a lot of problems in the world. But, and we can't do everything, but we can do something. And for me, as a scholar, as a human, as a mother, as a citizen, and now as an administrator at my university, I know that there's something that I can do to improve the lives of people. And I wanna share with you briefly a group of people I've been so blessed to work with and to help support. So out of the ugliness of COVID-19, which I guess is still going on, but the worst of COVID-19, I guess, is a grassroots movement, they call themselves Escucho Mi Voz, Listen to My Voice, Hear My Voice, based in Iowa City, and they meet in one of the two Catholic worker houses. This is the one off College Green, so when you're home, if you want to volunteer. I go there all the time. Awesome, we gotta talk after this, okay. <laughs> um, this is a grassroots movement started by meatpacking plant workers who had had enough. They're like, okay, our bosses are telling us that we have to show up for work, but we don't want to risk the lives of our family members, abuelitas taking care of our children, right? Because a lot of these, a lot of these migrant families live in mixed generational homes where the grandparents are taking care of the grandkids or even great grandparents. And so what we found was that Burmese, Vietnamese, um, Central Americans, African workers were saying we are not going to uh, risk family members' health. So. What started with a group of Latina moms, who Catholic moms, who went to St. Joseph Parish and St. Joseph and West Liberty, there's a connection there, they formed this grassroots movement and it's really growing throughout the state. They effectively, one of the first big things that they were able to do was to um, get COVID relief checks for essential workers, men and women who were deemed essential workers, but were not treated like essential workers, we can say. And so to me, that's really one concrete hopeful thing that's come out of the tragedy of COVID-19 and how leaders who should have been responding effectively did not. And so I think that's a hopeful thing. And a lot of priests and pastors are partnering with Escucho Mi Voz as well. How can 
our research make an impact? And I'm not just talking to faculty, I'm talking to students here, right? You all have something you're working on and that you're interested in. For me, being at a state institution where I, and I receive money generously from the Figgy family, it's been really important for me to think about the research I do has to have some kind of public impact. I feel like there's a moral imperative that, to that. So for me, it helps us amplify the voices of vulnerable people and communities. And I want to say it's not giving voice to, it's amplifying voices. Because as a scholar, I don't give voice to, I help amplify voice. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, my expertise as an ethnographer can be shared, and you all have your areas of expertise. So think about the things that you can do, right? It can be shared to support community members. So I've, I've spoken at a lot of um, supervisors meeting, I've helped translate, um, I've, I've, you know, Whenever I get a text from my friends at Catholic Worker, I try to show up. I'm like, okay, I'll be there. We can form partnerships with nonprofits, religious groups who want to work together to support migrants and refugees. And I think when it comes down to it, we can be bridge builders, connectors, and change agents. It's so easy to point to problems. And I think it's a start to point to problems. But I think sometimes where I get frustrated with academics, no offense to my academic friends, I'm an academic, was that sometimes we sit in the problem mode. We don't always want to solve. And I, I want to be a change agent. And I want you all to think about how you can do that. I think in Iowa right now, there's a lot of vitriol in my state, which is really painful. People on the left, people on the right. And one of the things that I wonder about, that I'm curious about, is how can we create common ground? What can I do in my research to create common ground and in my new role as an administrator of supporting faculty? Faculty friends in the room? I want y'all to think about the 10 students. Everyone are going back to curiosity. What are you curious about? Where can your curiosity lead you? Not only here at Holy Cross, but beyond when you're graduated, when you're working or in grad school. Um, where can your curiosity lead you? I like to think that the curiosity that I had as a five-year-old sitting in the midst of my grandparents' home listening to Arabic and being fascinated with what I was seeing and hearing that that has led me to be a more empathetic person toward, towards migrants and immigrants, and that has helped position me to be someone who could be a change agent. So that's where I'm going to end, and hopefully we can have some questions and answers. Thank you. Do we have time? Yes, we do have time, and because oh, we're being recorded, I just encourage if people can use the mic here, I'll make sure it's oh, on. Yeah. Sorry, I took this off at one point. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> We're doing that. Did you want to ask a question? Feel free to ask hard questions. So I like hard questions. Hard questions. <laughs> Well, thank you for your presentation. I do ethnographic work in India oh my gosh. Um, with uh, Dalits, uh, formerly called Untouchables. Oh and one of the things that I always and still struggle with are difficult ethical questions about the research, yeah. um, particularly in relation to communities who are deprived of power. So to the extent to which you can, could you share something about the ethical dilemmas that you faced and how you work through them? You have five hours. Jeez, yeah. that's hard. <laughs> and, and so tell me your name again. Uh, Matthew Schmaltz. Matthew, thanks for introducing. Yeah, what, wow, what, what important work that you do. Thank you for that. Jeez, that must be. Actually, one of the best books I've read, um, Catherine Boo, The Beautiful Hereafters. Mm -hmm. um, it was on a slum in Mumbai, I know, it, but just a beautiful, I love reading popular books, um, nonfiction that are just so well. So I, I love her work. Um, journalist, I think, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. And so I interviewed a lot of undocumented workers um, for this book. And so would always offer um, men and women to give me the name that they would prefer. So I never uh, provide their name and always change, you know. So these are the easy things, right? I always change details that no one can track them. Um, some men and women who are documented um, want their names. And traditional anthropological practices, you change all names, right? I actually disagree with that a little bit because some of the people I've interviewed really want their names in here because it's a form of empowerment for them, right? To see their names. 
And so I say I would diverge from some of my anthropology faculty friends in that I really go with what my interlocutors want. And so if I have an interlocutor, and that's sort of a fancy name for informant, but I think it's more than informant because we really do get to be friends, we get to know folks really well. I still have coffee with a lot of men and women who are in the book. Um, I think I try to lean into that. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the first two chapters are on documented women. And so I said, what name do you wish you would have been called? Rosa and Reina, you know, so that's her names in here. Um, so those are some of the easy things. Of course, you need to go through an institutional research board. If you do this kind of work, it has to, wherever you are, you, it has to be vetted by IRB, and IRB 02 is for the social science, and so I had to have it vetted and approved by the University of Iowa. I think the hardest thing for me was just, um, even though I'm from a lower class, working class family, um, I have white privilege, right? And I'm a university professor now, and I'm no longer lower, um, lower middle class, working class. And so I think I felt my privilege, what I struggled with, right, is I felt my privilege in powerful ways throughout the research, right? I cried a lot during the research. It took a while to actually write one of the chapters. Um, and I have a, a, a book chapter coming out in a couple months on a collection of anthropologists it's almost like existentialism in, in anthropology, kind of like talking about <laughs> the feelings, really, and I can send you that when it comes out. But yeah, I think, I mean, part of me is like, yes, it's like a way of, of like really grappling with white, white privilege, but a really upside of that is like, so what do I do with that? Once I've like cried and like really gnashed my teeth about it, I think, again, going back to the moral obligation, I, I feel morally obligated, and so part of the proceeds from the book, um, I've given to Catholic Worker House, um, I do a lot of community volunteering. We've got like houses and we have houses and homes. Um, a good friend of mine runs that where um, we deliver furniture and uh, homes where it's mostly refugees who um, can pay the monthly rent but who don't have enough money left over for like household items that many of us take for granted. Like I can run over to Target and get a throw rug or a lamp, right? But most of these families, you know, 90% of the income is going towards food and rent and right. So those are things that we can do, right? So I think that for me, the ethical, moral, if I'm getting to your question, again, I could talk to you for hours about this, but I think for me, it's necessary for me to be engaged in my community, to be doing some kind of work in the community, giving back somehow, um, in my new position as an administrator, I get to speak with state legislators on a fairly regular basis. And in my state right now, that's a tricky thing. It's a pretty deeply red state. I'm trying to move it more purple. You know, like, can we actually have these conversations, you know? And so I think a lot about, like, how can I best represent the men and women I know who are struggling in the midst of all this racist vitriol in my state right now that pains me, right? And so we can talk more about this, but I think we have to do something. Again, it's like we can't do everything. Some days I get really overwhelmed, like, why am I even doing this? Why am I even writing a book, right? But the beautiful thing is so many people have read this book. So many community members, so many churches are like, I want to do the work of DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. How do I do that? And I'm like, well, I'm not an expert, but let's talk. And so people are having those conversations. And so for people like you and myself, I think we can be part of those conversations of helping to create more inclusive environments. It might seem small, but it's something. You know what I mean? And just like ethnography is a snowball method, you start it and it keeps growing, I think, and building, I think that when we immerse ourselves in the community and engage in our communities as positive actors, it'll just keep growing. So that's a short answer to your excellent question. Probably not very satisfactory, sorry. <laughs> but students, you got a question. And push back too. Or was something like you wanted to hear more about? Yeah, tell me your name. Hi, my name's Tim. Hi, Tim. Um, I was wondering to what extent does this problem exist outside of Iowa? Do you see the same yeah. issues? Is Great Iowa question. in particular Great question. like the most prominent state, or does this exist in other areas in the Midwest? Do you see that are just as prominent? Great or question. I guess to an extension of that, why would you focus on Iowa? Yeah. Tim, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm so glad you asked that. I, I attended this more in the book, but I didn't in the talk, so let me, let me go back. So <clears throat> the beautiful thing about ethnography is that we, uh, we, we provide case studies, right? But I think it's really important also to show that this case study 
there is basically sort of a, a, like a slice of like a bigger issue, right? And so throughout the Midwest, you have meatpacking plants. So meatpacking plants moved out of big cities like Chicago Stockyards and Cincinnati, really to rural areas like Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, Arkansas, North Carolina, really in the 1960s, right? And that's when deregulation started. That's when deunionization started. It was no surprise that high paying union jobs, um, when they moved into more conservative areas with deregulation and right to work states, that's where most meatpacking plants happen to be today. So Iowa is really a microcosm, I would say, of a bigger issue. So I'm really glad you asked that. I think um, meatpacking plants are very much concentrated in the Midwest and Plain states, but then we also, like North Carolina, what's going on there is very similar to what's going on in Iowa. So too in Arkansas, and I'm actually giving talks there later this spring at UNC and University of Arkansas Fayetteville, which I'm really excited about, because Arkansas is like really big with chicken plants and also, um, North Carolina also with chicken plants. And so I think where you find meatpacking plants, so have you all heard the term intersectionality in your classes? Yes, it's, it's big now. So I think sometimes it's like, I think it's an important word though. So for me, I'm interested in the intersectionality, how the things, how migration, work, and religion come together. And we find that meatpacking plants, um, we find that um, high rates of church attendance and mosque attendance, um, and migration, primarily from Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America, happen to be in the Midwest, North Carolina, and Arkansas. So, very, so the, this book is very much like a little, it's basically indicative of a, of a bigger thing. Um, another good book, if you're interested in reading more, um, Steve Stripler is an anthropologist. Doesn't write about religion so much, but he's got a really good small book, beautiful book. It's called Chicken. Okay, so just look up chicken, Steve Sriffler. It's a really good book about, he's an anthropologist on um, the chicken industry in um, North Carolina. And then Angela Stoops, has a, she's an anthropologist, has a really good book, oh, I'm trying to think of the title, on black and white women working in the chicken industry in North Carolina. I'll remember, I'll remember it later. But I would say this is definitely, um, much also like Iowa, how we're seeing sort of pro proto unionization movement. I think Escucho Mi Voz, what they're what they're heading toward is trying to unionize, and personally that makes me happy as someone from a blue collar, what used to be a, a pro union town of Gary. It's not so much now, but I think that workers are really building towards that. I think we're starting to see stirrings of that in North Carolina and Arkansas as well. Was that did that address your question? That's an excellent question. Yeah, yeah. excellent question. See y'all. What do you want to know about? It's so hard, like shrinking down seven years of research and death. I'll ask one more later. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Or Professor Mandy, sorry. <laughs> so I love the particularities that you raise in the book. But in general, so you were curious about things. We, we started talking about uh, stereotypes. Yeah. So broadly speaking, yeah. what you thought about American yeah. religion Thank instruction you. and yeah. about for the, for yeah. For processing plants, for people, yeah. like how do you end up thinking differently about what religion is in America than you did before that's you started? Great, that is a big question. That's a good question. Jeez, that's a dissertation. That's not a book. Okay, no, that's good. Okay, yes. So I think I think there's always some truths to stereotypes. I'm just going to put that out there. But I think that what I what I term the sticky wicket of whiteness. I'm not trying in the book to explain away white racism. I'm trying to complicate it. And so the first couple chapters, um, I start with a couple of women who become dear friends of mine, Corinne Hardrothen, who's now 96, God love her, and her daughter Lois took some of the pictures for the book. Um, cradle Catholics, you know, uh, uh, live in Columbus Junction. Um, I think by introducing my readers to um, some native-born whites whose families fled the Irish potato famine, what I'm hoping the readers will get is like, wow, the stories that Corinne and her family are telling are very similar to these newer migrants, and they all really wanted to make new homes and to find, to create a better life for their children. I think what surprised me, what surprised me was that the packing plants, I expected 
that the workers would lean into their religion to get them through the hard parts of work, right? You know, as their wives would rub the camphor oil or the tigers, what was that, tiger's balm, I love the smell of that stuff. I, I got to smell a lot of that during this research today. We have these small the potions and lotions they had, my interlocutors. Um, I think I wasn't surprised that religion worked in a certain way for the workers, but I was surprised that the meatpacking plants themselves were cultivating their own lexicon of faith, if you will. And I think part of it, I always want to take people at their word, and a lot of the men and women I interviewed who were at the, at the upper echelons of packing lots were deeply faithful people. But I think that they also, so I don't want to question their religious motivations, because I think they're being very sincere about um, being Methodists or Baptists or Catholics or Jehovah's Witnesses, as, as one of the upper management was, members was. But I think also that it's a way to help them feel a relief from the cognitive dissonance that they were experiencing. So I'm a good religious person, but they don't have to be on the line and get injured day after day like the workers are, right? The management team is almost all white. The workers themselves, there are very few white people on the line today. Very few black Americans actually, it's mostly African and Latino and Asian. And so I think that what surprised me was this creation this cultivation of a religious language. And I'm still trying to work through that. I'm working on an article actually trying to sort of understand the role of religion and, and like why bother in a way for these uh, packing plant managers. Um, also one of the biggest, the pleasant surprise, I didn't include him today, was I became really good friends with Mike Gager. He runs the hot side, so the slaughter side of Iowa premium beef. I probably should include him. <laughs> I have to say, I had my own stereotypes when I first met Mike. I'm like, oh wow, you know, Mike's, we're really different, we're from, but actually we're really not. We're actually from very similar backgrounds. I'm the first woman on my mom's side to go to college. I had very few folks on my dad's side who went to college. Mike, uh, I think he finished high school, did a lot of railing against University of Iowa and a bunch of, you know, new snobs in Iowa City. I'm like, yeah, yeah. So what I realized, what I realized is that we, as professors and at my university have to do a better job as translators. We have to do a better job. We have to get out of our bubble. And this is what I'm gonna specifically say to my colleagues in Iowa City when I give the presidential lecture on Thursday. But I'm gonna say, you know, it's, it's hard, but we've gotta get out of our bubble. We've gotta get out of the ivory tower. And we have to convince the good people of Iowa that the work that we do matters, right, for the state of Iowa, right? And so I felt like, you know, much of the work that we do as scholars is translation, right? Whether, whether it's language or we do archival work or we're in the field translating literally what people are telling us. I felt like I was a, this was a surprise for me. I was a trans, that I was a translator for the white working class men and women I met, even if they were at the higher echelons of the plant, most of them did not have college degrees. And I think I helped, by the time I left, I think they felt a little bit better about Iowa City and professors and that we weren't all, irredeemable snobs, and, and I will take this as a win. And I will tell you I've been a vegetarian for 30 years, so this was a very difficult project for me to do. At the end of my uh, research at IPB, they offered me a job. And I said, like, oh, I'm like, that's really cool. You know, that they, you know. So I think that as professors, we need to act a little less like professors and more like students when we're out in the field. You know what I'm saying? So I think that what surprised me is that I had my own stereotypes. I had my own stereotypes about white working class Americans that I thought I had moved away from. But I'm like, oh, I grew up, I grew, I grew up with these folks. I'm like them. But I think that because I've been part of the university system for so long, I had sort of sheltered myself. So this is like full disclosure. I think it's really important when we do this kind of work, going back to me mentioning having humility and also being very self-reflexive. And so I mean, I, I, you know, when I was going through my field journals, so I, you know, as an anthropologist, I would keep little notebooks of my observations. Then I would have another set of notebooks on my, on sort of like thinking through the observations. Because I think it's really good to keep ourselves in check. And you know, what are my own moods and motivations? Um, Mike and I ended up being good buddies. We went. I think I smoked ten packs. I, I don't smoke, <laughs> but like I took tons of smoke breaks with him that week. Marlboros, man, those are, those are, I mean, I, I, I sucked up a lot of secondhand smoke, but during those smoke breaks, Mike and I had a lot of great conversations, really amazing conversations about meaning of life, about gender in the workplace. He was, he's really promoting women in the workplace. Who knew? That was another stereotype I had, right? That guys like Mike 
wouldn't be like into you know promoting women in the workplace. And so I realized that I had my own stereotypes. And so this kind of work, I think, has held me responsible and has kept me honest. I don't have a lot of answers so much as more questions, which I know is probably frustrating for students. But I think, again, that the questions that I still have from that, this project will propel me into trying to help create more policies, right? right. That was a long answer. I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, some of the students time. are joining us for dinner, so they'll get to ask questions then. Great. Is there anybody else? Who wants to oh, please. Just that one. I only hear from the biggies, too. So. Um, I know. Uh, I'm so, so glad to have you uh, <laughs> here in Worcester. Uh, we both taught as we can be at Augustana College in the West Wing. We live in Dallas for that. I'm part of it. Chrissy, my work has to do with um, uh, immigration and documentary film. And uh, in a co edited volume that I have, actually, a former student, Jared List, oh my gosh. has a chapter oh. on the hospital raid. Um, Luis Argueta abused uh, uh, film, and I think Luis Argueta has also spoken here at uh, Holy Cross. So anyway, in that film, um, it's about uh, meatpacking um, yep. in a um, factory in, uh, in Hallsville, yeah. where there are children working. And so that's my question. If in your research, you talk about the American dream, right? And, and as immigrants, <coughs> we, we come to this country. And we hope that the American dream is, is yes for us, but it's also for our future generations. Right. And so in, in your research, A, I don't know if you encounter uh, minors working in these factories, or what is the, um, the perception of, of, the, of the migrant families mm -hmm. in relationship to the American dream yeah. and what they hope uh, for their children? Yeah. Thank you, Esteban. Yeah, Esteban, Kathy, and I, and my husband, who's a historian, taught at Augustine College together for many years. So this is such a great reunion. Um, yes, the Postville Raids, 2008, Postville, Iowa. Great movie, great book by um, actually a journalist who teaches at University of Iowa, too, on, on Postville. Postville actually so deserves, it remains the largest ice raid in American history where I think close to 400 men and women, mostly Guatemalan, many Mayan speakers, or, you know, Quiche speakers, um, not Spanish, not Spanish is not the correct first language, second language, were deported and many children were left behind. And the community members really rallied. And actually, I've become friends with one, the nun, who's now retired, who now lives in, in Western Iowa, who's reached out about impacting America. So all these neat connections today. Um, the Postville raids were really a call to arms to priests and religious leaders throughout Iowa who really wanted to make a difference, who saw the horrors of parents being ripped you know, away from their children. Um, and so for Father Joseph, whom I introduced you before, it was really a call to action for him. He's Filipino, he's a migrant himself. And so that's when he became very into social justice. So I think 2008 was very much a catalyst for a lot of religious leaders in Iowa to become more involved with social justice and to become more pro-immigrant, pro-refugee. I mean, we see the sticker in Iowa, America Needs Farmers, you know, ANF, which we have one too on one of our cars. I think the priests I, I've worked with, if they could have their way, they'd have like America Needs Refugees and ANF. They would have that because they, they see, it's refugees, it's migrants who are working in all these plants, who are putting food on our table, right? I have not noticed in the two plants I spend a lot of time with, I did not notice child labor, but this is an issue in many smaller plants. And I don't know, I mean, Twitter can be a really ugly place, but there are a couple journalists right now who are on Twitter. One's Alice Driver, and I'm blanking on the other one's name, who are doing research in packing plants and who are writing, who are, who are noting child labor. And um, an article just came out in the New York Times in Spanish. Yes, yeah, so this is an issue. I did not notice it in the course of my research, but certainly not saying it does not take place. It just wasn't on my radar when I was there. Um, I, think, I think we're seeing more child labor abuses, apparently since COVID, um, Human Rights Watch is saying this. I also want to read your book. I just saw it just came out through Florida, so I want to read it. It's on my list. Um, that's something else, you know. Um, none of the workers I interviewed, they work there. I, I have a phrase in the book, their work, so I, I have a big section on a man I got to know, Fernando. I call his, his beautiful narrative as a kind of religious 
parents see it as a kind of a religious pay it forward. So if they pray enough and if they work hard enough that their children and grandchildren will not have to work at the plants. The only way any of my interlocutors would want any family member working at the plant would be if they were not on the line, that they would be like a CEO or CFO, or it smells like Febreze, but it doesn't smell like blood and guts and awful. So absolutely, the American dream is I'm gonna work hard, I want my kids to go to Iowa State, or University of Iowa, or UNI. Um, we're getting more and more students, young people from West Liberty, Iowa. Um, they actually have a packing plant there with West Liberty Foods. It's a turkey processing plant. Um, I did not get access there. I really wanted to have a chapter on turkey, but they didn't buy my wanting to tell their story, I guess. But, um, but we're seeing more and more young people come from Columbus Junction, from West Liberty, a town called Marshalltown for meat packing plant sites. And we've got a really wonderful Latina who's with the Tippy College, a business school, who is on the forefront of, of recruiting efforts and also retention efforts. And so that makes me really happy. So tell us a little. We'll talk more at dinner. So, so yeah. Unless you have a question or you yeah, people, I individually, we can, I have to yeah. stop unless you, were you, was there something you were going to ask? Okay, you can talk after that. So. I know, and some of us will get to have dinner with uh, Christy, so thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. This has been so fun.